people have a very hard time understanding the concept of what we're doing. One group in America wants to talk about the fact that we run charter schools, and to them, we're a charter school operator, which is a school that's independent of the regular rules and the union's uh, regulations that govern most of the education uh, in this country. And another group wants to talk about the fact that we provide a comprehensive array of services for young people. And these two groups are at war in America. I mean, it's really war. They hate one another. And they write nasty things about one another in the newspapers. And this group saying this other group is really terrible. Uh, what we have done uh, is decide that uh, for this issue, and I just couldn't agree more with the speaker uh, who was just up, that in education has not changed at all. And I grew up in the South Bronx, and the schools were bad there when uh, I was in them 50 years ago, uh, and they're still bad there today. Uh, so you have a system that's failed literally uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of kids, uh, and we will run school exactly the same way this year that we ran school uh, when I was a kid. Uh, so uh, we're locked into a way of thinking about education uh, that's a real problem. So what we decided to do uh, was to really work with the most disadvantaged. Uh, and when I say the most disadvantaged, I mean that Central Harlem, if you look at child outcomes, uh, had the worst child outcomes on any sort of measure you wanted to use. It was graduation rates, it was reading scores, it was incarceration, if it was violence, it was families breaking apart and going into foster care. Uh, Central Harlem, if it wasn't number one, was number two or maybe number three, but it was always in the top three. In these kinds of places, we don't think you can just do a great school. You can do a great school, and they need great schools, and, and we believe in great schools. Uh, but if you've had a community that has failed its kids for generations, uh, and you want to end that cycle of poverty, you've got to do more than just do schools. And so our education strategy is wrapped around a way of trying to improve the outcomes for an entire community, not just for kids who are in school. I run my own schools, but my kids go to other schools. Uh, typically, if there are uh, dangers in my community, I worry about the kids in my charter school, but I worry about the kids who go to all the public schools uh, in that area. So we decided that we had to focus on an area. Uh, and uh, it, it was mentioned it's now 97 blocks. But I tell folks, we started this on one block. Uh, these problems are so massive, they're so overwhelming, that most places when I look around the country, people literally are turning around in circles. Right? They try and work over here and they say, oh my god, we got something going on over here, and then you try and fix this over there. We said, let's just fix one block. Uh, and if the block had all of the, the drugs, uh, gangs, violence, uh, it was uh, dirty with, with uh, rats and, and, and vermin all over everywhere. And we said, look, we can't do all the Harlem, but if we could just do this one block, could we not learn from that how to do the next block? So we did one block, and you know, uh, the problem, if you've been in a community that it's been failing for 50 years, and you do something, right, you do a block, well, people say, yeah, I know why you did that block, because you had Mother Jones on that block, so that's why that block worked. You don't really have an answer, right? So then we did the second block. And then they said just sort of the same thing about the second, yeah, well, that was, by the third block, by the time, so this, so this is what was happening when we began. If you'd walk down Lenox Avenue, look down, 119th Street, and you'd say, wow, it looks pretty good down here. And you look left, and you say, ooh, that looks pretty bad. Then you go to 120th Street, you look down and say, whoa, what's going on over there? And then you look left, you say, boy, that's bad. By the time people went to 121st Street, they said, something's going on here. Right? And then people said, I know they're trying to get rid of us. They're going to clean the place up so they can get rid of us, because why else would people fix up their community? But we believed that the signals that community gives to kids suggest to them what their future is going to look like. So if in your community you have violence and drugs and get, kids figure out very quickly, chances are I'm not getting out of this thing. I better live my life hard and fast uh, because there's no telling, there's no guarantees, and you want me to work on algebra. I mean, well, that doesn't make any sense. I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to live to be 17 and you're talking about something that's going to help me when I'm 30. So trying to change that cultural context that kids grow up in so that when you're improving education, kids are prepared and they believe that this is possible. 
So we started with this one block, uh, and we believed uh, that you have to start early. So how early? We start at birth. We have something we call baby college, and we start with parents because our parents simply don't know all the new science about brain development. So this is how this thing goes. The wealthiest, most educated people know all the techniques. They know all the strategies. The poorest and least educated people, they know nothing at all about how you develop children's brains. And we have become very sophisticated in understanding how that brain develops the serve and response with, with uh, verbalizations to kids, how come that's so important, how it begins to rewire the brain very early on. So we figured out, let's make sure our parents actually learn these skills and these techniques. Uh, the next thing is we try and eliminate the gap between our children starting at four. So we get the kids into an all-day pre-K program, uh, and we staff it really, really heavy, four to one. And the idea is to try and make sure those kids enter kindergarten on grade level. And then uh, this is the problem that happens uh, all over America. We have lots of great programs. They work with kids for two years. And then they say, well, what happens? And you end up, the kids end up looking like everybody else. Our belief is you have to provide real strong supports for kids from the moment of birth until those kids go to college, and then guess what happens to our kids when they go to college? They all end up dropping out of college. So that's like getting a kid 99 yards. You got one yard left, right? And everybody says, okay, that's it. And so you end up with these horrendous dropout rates. So we said, look, let's stay with the kids until they graduate from college. So right now, we've got over 650 of our kids in college, right? And our job is to stay with them because there are reasons kids end up dropping out of college. <laughs> our job is to stay with these kids through college. Now, I have to tell you, I had uh, one of my uh, kids who graduated this year came in and said, uh, Jeff, uh, I, I want to go to law school. I want to know what the Harlem Children's Zone program is. I said, it's over, all right? <laughs> this thing does end now. This is not like forever and ever, all right? But, 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 but understand now, and I'm going to say something about schools because and, and, and uh, then take some questions. But understand what happens in a community where no one was going to college. Then when I've got 600 kids who grew up in my program in college, those kids come home, and they work with my fourth graders, and they work with my third graders. And my fourth and third graders see all these kids from Harlem look just like them. All of them are in college. What do you do? I'm in college. What do you do? I'm in college. Yes, every single kid you see there, you grow up thinking, well, all the kids in Harlem go to college. It just becomes sort of in your mind an expectation that you're not going to end up on the streets hustling and selling drugs and robbing people. You're going to college where all the other kids are at. So this idea of can you create a cultural context for success, we think that's how you're going to really end the cycles of uh, poverty. But now, if the folks are uh, upset with me, a lot of people are upset with me uh, in America about my positions on education, uh, it is because I believe you have to improve failing schools. I absolutely agree that there's a strategy, and we have put our heads in the sand about this strategy, and so I'm going to tell the world uh, that we need to change some things. Now, here's something that absolutely needs to be changed. I get in trouble saying this, and I'm going to say it today. I say it all over the country. I believe, and I know this is radical, I believe that if you're a terrible teacher, you should be fired. I, I know, I know, I know that sounds harsh. People are thinking, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. Uh, I, I absolutely believe that. We have a system that you can't get rid of people who can't teach. And you know what happens to those people? Guess whose schools they go to? They don't go to upper middle class schools. They get rid of those kids. They dump those poor teachers in the worst areas of our city where the kids need the best teachers, they end up getting the worst teachers because the good schools, the way you stay at good schools, you get rid of your lousy teachers. But because you can't fire them, guess what you do? You ship them to Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant and places like that. And there's this belief that, well, those kids, they're not doing so well anyhow, so they don't really need the great teachers. And it's the exact opposite. Uh, we have one of the shortest school days in the industrialized world. Now here you have a whole bunch of kids who are failing, right? And no one thinks if the kids are all failing, 
maybe we should work a little longer to see if they'll succeed. That thought never crossed anybody's mind. I just don't get that. And you know what, so this is the problem. We have allowed in poor communities, not in wealthy communities, because they won't tolerate it. In poor communities, we have allowed failure to be a standard. It, no one gets upset. There's no crisis if all the poor kids fail. Uh, no, everybody, guess what? Everybody goes home in June, takes the summer off, comes back. Guess what's going to happen next year? The same thing. All the kids are going to fail, and we don't feel the pressure to go in, work weekends, work longer days, work summertime. Uh, that system has to end in this country. So we think this is not just about can you provide health care and dental care and social services for kids and rebuild the community and straighten those communities out, but you've got to improve real teaching and learning, and you've got to hold the adults accountable uh, if you're going to improve schools in these communities. Now, look, I got in trouble with my son, who's a, a lawyer, uh, because he said, uh, Dad, all my friends are mad at you. I said, your friends are mad at me? Why? He said, because you said we should send all the lousy teacher, teachers to upper middle class communities. <laughs> I said, well, I did say that. But what the full quote was, if we can't fire lousy teachers, we should send them all to upper middle class communities because those kids could afford one lousy teacher. My kids can't. So we need the quality teachers in our program. And so if we're going to really, I think, give these kids an opportunity to be successful, we've got to step our game up. And we've got to make sure they have great educators, great schools, that we hold the adults accountable. But at the same time, we've got to do a support for these kids from birth straight through to college.